am Jeffrey Joseph Centerman, and you are watching Rugby Wrap Up. Coming up next on Rugby Wrap Up, Major League Rugby Talk. Brought to you by Friends of the British Council. Hey everybody, welcome back to Rugby Wrap-Up. Matt McCarthy at the Fantasy Sports Network, Studio 34 in New York City, talking rugby, and we have got brilliance here today. We have got Martin Pengelly, as always, but over here on the right with his baby blue eyes and his blue shirt <laughs> is Pete Stern Steinberg, not Sternberg. Not Stein Sternberg. Pete Steinberg. Steinberg. Uh, formerly the uh, national team uh, head coach for the women's program and now uh, gallivanting about the United States covering the MLR in the broadcast booth. That's right. It's been great. It's a new career for me. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Uh, learned a lot. Been pulled along by a couple of old pros who've been doing it for a few years and uh, was just really honored to be able to do the final last weekend in San Diego. That's right. We, we, we were there together. Martin, uh, can you give an assessment of what you think of his broadcasting so far? I think it's been fantastic. I've been sitting there wishing I could sort of convince myself I should be on instead, but I can't. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, uh, um, I got my first social media mean tweet where someone told me the a mean tweet. Mean tweet. Yeah. So the first, <laughs> I guess this, this is, I mean, Martin would be able to tell you probably more than me, but when you step out into the public, so I, there, there was a tweet that sort of said, dear CBS, please don't have Pete Steinberg on next year. I have to turn off the volume every time he commentates. Oh, that's a good sign. Uh, that's, yeah. That's <laughs> just, doing, you know what, that's love in a way. I know it is. Yeah. I mean, he, he even used my, my Twitter handles to make sure I saw it. So I was like, oh, so he, I mean, he cared enough to look me up. Right. Uh, guys, so. I've got, we've completely forgotten our other guest on today's show, <laughs> Ryan Ginty. Ryan, I completely forgot. I'm, I want to apologize. Uh, Ryan Ginty, ladies and gentlemen, of Next Level Rugby is on the horn via Skype. Ryan, how are you? Hey, how you doing? Uh, I am clearly less brilliant than the two gentlemen that you have with you, <laughs> but I'll hold up the rear out here in my attic in Connecticut because none of you in New York have one of these. And we've, <laughs> and we've got to keep you coming back here, Ryan, because you've got Ronan Nelson locked in that closet back there so you can do his rockin' Ronan Nelson's Major League Rugby recap by Ryan Ginty. Yeah, I can't believe nobody's uh, filed a missing persons report yet. Um, but I did hear he was on the sidelines in San Diego. Possibly there was a spotting, but uh, I can neither confirm nor deny that. All right. Uh, yeah, he was there. He actually interviewed Pete Steinberg he, on the si on the pitch after the match. He he did. He's alive and well, but seemed to be under the control of Matt. So that is a concern. <laughs> he might be running errands right now. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, listen. I want I, I want to go back to that point, Pete, where somebody came out and they said something. Tell that guy to pound sand because. As a producer and a director, I think it's brilliant what you guys have done. The fact that we have a three rotation broadcasters in the booth now uh, for the last couple of weeks, I think it's come off great. And uh, I think your insight into the game, and especially when uh, Billy was offsides or created that obstruction, it's spot on, Pete. I love having you on the show. So whoever that is, tell them to pound sand. All well, right, I apologize. Pound sand. <laughs> <laughs> I should go back and see if this was take, one of the uh, I'll, I'll take one of the down. things that Matt 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 created. Well, I, I will say there's been a lot of work. I mean, I was I, I I had not been involved before, but there's a huge amount of work that goes into every single one of those productions. And I think hats off to um, Major League Rugby. Uh, I mean, I have to say thanks to Pat Guthrie, who's the guy that got me in this business, um, and then uh, Dragonfly Media, who were the producers. I, I mean, a lot of work goes in. I was. I mean, my first few weeks, um, I was probably doing 10 or 15 hours of prep every week. It was just took a lot as, as you got into it and you learned the players. But every time you did a team for the first time, yeah. Yeah, it, it was a huge amount of, yeah. of preparation. So I've, I've, I've gained a lot of um, uh, respect for the people that are in the business. Let's get to Rockin' Ronan Nelson's Major League Rugby Recap with Ryan Ginty of the final, and then we can banter over well, it was the championship match that we'd all been waiting for. You know, Glendale versus Seattle. Seattle having been beaten twice by this team before, and we all know how hard it is to beat a team three times in one season, and Glendale just didn't get it done. 
But I think that this game, it lived up to the hype of what it wanted to be. As a fan, I was excited. I was watching it all the way through. Uh, it wasn't until I went back and I actually dissected it and started looking at it more as a coach that, that some things started to pop out. But as a fan, I let myself enjoy it. I thought it was awesome. I mean, it was a ride. It had four lead changes you know, throughout the match, um, and it was just great. So let's just jump right into it. At the 12-minute mark, to get on the board and not rolling away penalty against Seattle sets up a five meter line out mall, which sees Zach Fenolio score. A little bit later, another lead change for it, another five meter line out. This is playing a consistent theme throughout this uh, throughout this match as far as scoring. Uh, but Ray Barkwell, he peels right off of the mall, slips at Davies, uh, maybe attempted tackle, and then muscles past John Quill on the deck to make it seven to eight for the boys from Seattle. It would seem that Seattle would have another try as Matt Turner great gets a great open field run off of a great play that was came off of another line out, but it would be called back. And upon further review, it would be a Vili Tilletau obstruction call, which uh, Pete Steinberg, guest on the show, pointed out as he obstructed Peter Dahl from getting into that spot, which set free one of the runners who offloaded it to Turner. But then... A what Seattle scramble defense coming back saves a Harley Davidson try as Vili Tilletau would inject himself into the game again and stopping what would be a certain Harley Davidson try and a Glendale lead. Seattle is offsides, and then we see the score extended 12 to 8 off of a five meter line out as Zach Fanolia scores his second try, third by way of lineup in this match. It would then go back. They would extend their lead further as Seattle loses possession. Sean Davies kicks it down and off the chase. Vili Tilletau has an opportunity to dive on that ball, misses it. McGee picks it up, hits a streak in Mike Cruze, who alley-oops through two defenders and hits Bryce Campbell in for a try. But then that don't count out the Seattle team because they would be back two minutes later as a 22-meter lineout. Villy takes a hard line as he still up, runs over a couple players, gets a great offload in Hatting. Hatting gets the extra 10 meters, and then from three meters out, Willie Rosaleka scoops and scores off the deck, scoring a great try, bringing it to 19 to 13 and then two minutes after that Seattle is back with Mac as he switches direction quick hands finds a streaking Peter Tiberio he cuts back inside and then he finds the eight man Hatting who was big all day they scores a go ahead try on that then you see a kick from Peter Smith. That would be the end of the scoring. But this game would end with some high drama as Glendale had a couple of opportunities. With 75 minutes gone in the match, a bad pass goes into touch, missed opportunity. And then the last missed opportunity that this Glendale team had was a Will McGee. He had a penalty kick at the 50 missed touch and then Seattle boots it back down the other end of the field. And then this game would end as Glendale committed another penalty, quick tap, and then kicked into touch. And then you have it. Seattle is your major league rugby champions, beating Glendale at Torero Stadium. Thank you, Ryan. So, Pete, penalties, Glendale, you know, kind of uncharacteristic. Actually, not uncharacteristic. Well, they like to There's... live on the edge. They get away with penalties, I should say. Well, no, they. Um, so if you go back and you look at the Glendale team and you look at their stats, they've been the best team in the league all season. And the two things that have made their games close are penalties and handling errors. So in this game, they had 14 handling errors yeah. against five. Yeah. Like, that's, like, that's the game right there, right? So here, I, I mean, penalties were a problem. I mean, the only way that Glendale were going to beat the Seawolves um, the defense was on lineouts. They didn't get a line break the whole game. I mean, that's pretty incredible. And so, you know, I think that the things that reared their ugly heads for Glendale in that game have done relatively consistently throughout the season. What did you think of the match? Well, I thought the same thing stood out. The uh, errors, which uh, in part I thought was down to the sort of frenetic nature of the game. It was fast. Uh, too fast, forced, I might say, in some of the, the attacks and some of the passes that were, were going in. Uh, and obviously, well, not going in, going into touch, not going to hand. It was um, of a piece to me with, with a lot of the play, which I enjoy, actually, the, the sort of uh, fast 
frenetic nature of the play. It was, it was fascinating to watch. It was full of mistakes, but you know, it, it remained entertaining. It remained close. Good tries went in. Um, it was quite quite a spectacle. And, and I think that that's really interesting, Martin, because when we look at what Major League Rugby needs to do, like we sit here as rugby fans and we analyze the game, but the average person that turns on CBS Sports Network has never seen it before. The game that they saw was entertaining. Yeah. For all the errors that were in there, yeah. it was a great game to watch. And even us, like Ryan said, it was an exciting game. And so I think the most remarkable thing about the Major League Rugby season is how many games were like that. Mm. It's like 80% yeah. of the games yeah. were within one try. Yeah. And that yeah, like is with, with the Sabercats, you know, right. one it, and seven. One and seven, but like their, 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 their point differential of loss was like under seven points yeah. for all of them. And so that's the real big win for Major League Rugby is the competitiveness of the league. And I think we showed it in the final. And so this is something I wouldn't normally say. Um, there's a fascinating piece gone up today in The Federalist, of all things. You've got a communist rugby writer from The Guardian and a, and a hard, hard right conservative writer from The Federalist writing about Major League Rugby. And this Federalist piece is saying that the game... Uh, the standard isn't high enough for Major League Rugby to grow, which I disagree with. I Absolutely. The standard is what the standard is because it's the first year of this pro and semi-pro it's league. Someplace. So it's a good piece. It's worth reading. He's got a strange prejudice against malls as well, which must be that like Trumpists don't like malls. And <laughs> Bernie Sanders loves them all. Um, okay, interesting. It, little politics in rugby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But he's, his, his, he's trying to make the point that it won't, it won't grow if, it, if the skill level isn't higher. I don't agree. I think the skill level will increase as it carries on, and I hope it keeps this nature of hard-hitting, frenetic, quick, attacking rugby. That's the thing. It's attacking. Well, I think, you know, and Martin has, you know, I've read your pieces, and you've talked to, and, and, and watched this show, and you've talked about that there's a, um, there's a looseness and a willingness to try things, and I think that's because in America... It's called sports entertainment, yeah. not just sport. Yeah. Yeah. And so may, all the people involved in Major League Rugby know the business that they're in, and that's sports entertainment. And so they would prefer to play a wide-open, excited game that gets more people in the seats than to lose and play a, lo a, a, and play a boring game. Yeah. And I think that, that – so whether it's like not the, like a lack of relegation or a new one or whatever, I actually think it's – Everyone in Major League Rugby is in sports entertainment, not just sports. Yeah, I think the, the lack of... I've, I'm hung up on the lack of relegation. I've wanted England to do away, do away with it since it went pro. Um, I think it's a big thing. But yeah, I think you make a very good point there about the entertainment on top of that. So f lack, f lack of fear of relegation. Uh, necessity to entertain. Right. It's potent. And it, should, it needs to stay potent. Steve Lewis made very good points last week about your know, years. Not true. Ago. Can't be true. Steve who? <laughs> no, okay, I'm sorry. Chair. <laughs> Small Scottish guy. Has a big collar. That's, that's <laughs> um, he, he was saying, you know, year two, you'll start to get players who might get cut. You're playing for your job. There's more pressures come in. Pressures, the financial pressure will likely increase if Teams crowds, have to cut don't, players. So on yeah. and so on. But I, 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 I'm optimistic that that uh, American approach to the game will stay and get better as the players and the skill gets better. Vili uh, Talatau, is that how you say his name? Pretty much, yeah. Because okay, he's a big man. I don't want to, I'm sorry, Vili, okay, but I love your hair, number one. As a bald man, I would do that if I could. But along with the um, padding, those two made the big difference. Well, you know, I, I felt healthy. Again. Healthy, right. I mean, I, I, we obviously didn't know how good Hadding was. I mean, he played right. in for Ohio in the pro, but his impact in... Um, for the Seawolves at the end of the season. And I, I do wonder if his freshness right. helped. He did look fresher than everyone else, but well, he's well, he obviously said, a great player. He said his player. lungs were on fire. Right, right. right. Yeah. Um, but, but I thought, you know, I, 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 I felt in both games that actually the Seawolves um, made a mistake, not with those two players, but in the back row by dropping Shermer, who does a lot of the hard work. Again, they had seven turnovers that they gave up at the tackle contest. And I think Shermer at six, instead of Duchal, they had too many ball carriers. But, the, but their ball carriers did the job that they sure. were supposed to do. So it's sort of like tough to argue against it. Ryan, you got any final thoughts on this one? No, I'm just excited for year two, and uh, I thought it was uh, great stuff. I really appreciate all the hard work that everybody from the Major League franchise office to the teams to the players have put in, you know, and uh, really pumped for season two. But, Ryan, you know, before we let you go, we've got this massive cup sitting here, the uh, Amal Cygnus um, Club National Sevens Cup. 
compare it to the MLR shield that was a 400-pound slab of cement. <laughs> what, what, what are we doing here? I mean, the, these are enormous pieces of hardware. It's because it's America, right? That's what we do here, Ryan? Go, go big or go home, Mr. McCarthy. <laughs> Well, when this thing arrives at your studio apartment, you tell me what you think of it. Anyway, uh, and, but the 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 whole when um, during the post game, right? Uh, the players are trying to hoist the uh, the, the MLR. I think shield. it's eighty pounds. <laughs> yeah, it's eighty pounds of titanium steel. Yeah, it's titanium steel. It's not concrete. It's only, titanium steel. My only point is how do you drink out be, of it? It had to be driven down as well, too. It was especially escorted by an individual from Major League Rugby because you can't ship 80 pounds because we all know how expensive that is. So just well, think about that. That was I, driven to San Diego. I, I'm just going to call out Stacey Pates, who was the sideline reporter, who somehow managed to corral that group. So yes. on TV, that it actually nice. looked, it was for those of you that weren't what, who were there, you would see the craziness. And she did an amazing job. And I think it looked great on TV as a celebration. It looked like a real professional sports celebration. And that's what rugby has to look like on CBS Sports. It has to look like all the other professional sports in America. Yeah, we, we got um, great footage of that celebration right down in the middle of it. So that, that'll be part of this. Well, Dean, thought. well, Dean Howes said to me on the phone for my uh, piece at the weekend that, that the shield looks and feels like rugby. It does. It's, it's got that, uh, it's, well, the size of something like the Ranfurly Shield or the, or the French. Yeah. Rugby shield. yeah. Uh, and that speaks about, to that point. About Dean Howes, you know why he's a qualified CEO? Because in that madness, in that heat, he's down there. He's in a suit, and he is not perspiring. <laughs> and I said that to him. I'm like, you got my vote, pal. I mean, right there. You look like a CEO. He's just like, it's just like a, right out of central casting. There's a CEO. He is not sweating. We're all, like, dripping, and everybody's – and he, there he is, calm as can be. And I mean, him and Nick Benson and the whole – I mean, when I say the whole MLR stuff, it's not that big. Right. right? I mean, it, but, but those guys have worked so hard – to be able to pull this off and, and you know, the excitement and it, I mean, I'm just, I'm blessed to be part of the start and excited to see what it's going to be like over the next few years. And on that note, guys, we got to take a quick break. We're getting told from downstairs. Uh, Ryan, we're going to have to let you go. Thank you, sir. It was my pleasure, Matt. And uh, stay frosty. Stay frosty. Give it, All right. You got it, my friend. We're going to, we're going to have Phil Mack on in just a second. We'll be right back after these words. Been blind since I was four. And I've never seen a beer commercial or a beer label. None of that stuff influences me. I drink beer because of the taste. And my beer is Paps Blue Ribbon. It has the taste and the flavor. What do you think is on the label? I think there's a, a naked woman riding on a unicorn, jumping over fire. That's good beer. And we are back on Rugby Wrap-Up, continuing our Major League Rugby Talk and uh, with Mr. Pete Steinberg and Mr. Martin Pengelly. But we traded in, thankfully, we traded Ryan Ginty in for none other than Phil Mack of the champion Seattle Seawolves. Phil, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I know you were traveling today. We went through, jumped through some hoops. So, Phil, a tough season, a lot of turmoil. You guys overcame one obstacle after the next. You went in there. Some of us, like me, called you the underdog, and you went out there and you you won the championship. How, how did it happen? Take us through it. Um, yeah, I just think you know that that group of uh, of men is pretty resilient, and uh, I said it all year. If, there, if there's a rugby problem that we can't solve in that room, I, I don't know if it'll be solved anywhere. Um, you know, we have experience from all over the world, and. Losing the coach early in the season was difficult, but um, you know we made a, a decision as a group to to not let it uh, fracture us and just to pull together and uh, you know try and try and do the best we can. And um, you know I think that resilience really paid off. Come the last 15 minutes of that game. What was the biggest challenge for you as a player, having the dual role? You kind of have to just separate yourself a little bit more than than you'd like to if you were just a player. Um, had to have some really tough conversations with with uh, a lot of the guys if they weren't in the 23 for a given week and we also had that import rule that we we're um you know stuck with so we had 12 international players and we could only play eight so having those conversations with uh, 
potential starters that aren't even in the 23 was was tough. And um, I think as a group, we we all understood that it was for the betterment of the team. And, and those guys, uh, in fairness, took it really well and kept training hard. And our, I think, um, you know, our training intensity throughout the entire season was awesome. So, Phil, you know, going into that game playing Glendale for the third time, there probably wasn't much that was new. But were, were there things that, when you went in that kind of played out the way you thought they would play out or were there things that um, like surprised you in the game? No, we knew Glendale, you know, they're, they're a good team. And um, I think their biggest strength is their organization and super well coached and they're, they're a cohesive bunch. Um, for us, our, our big focus was trying to make them tackle. And um, we set a, a goal out to try and get six plus phases, 10 or more times um, and just keep that ball, keep the retention and um, just keep the pressure on them for as long as possible. You know, we made a couple of mistakes and they punished us for it. And, that, and that's what good teams do. Um, but in terms of what we needed to do and what we ch- planned to do, it was, it was basically the same thing. Stick to the basics and, you know, back our defense um, and back our set piece, which we've done all year. You can tell me a bit about the uh, off-field support in Seattle that you've had this year. I mean, obviously the sellouts at the stadium have been uh, impressive. It seems like Seattle's really maybe even stolen a march on the rest of the league in terms of the backing in the city and from the uh, sort of Seawolves fans. Is that, is that the sense you have? No, you can't say enough about the Seattle fans. And, um, you know, I think all the credit has to go to Adrian Bell for Shane Skinner um, for putting together a pretty incredible team. Um, they're cramped into a small office in, in Seattle and managed to, to pack a stadium every game we've had. And uh, the support um, just locally has been phenomenal. And, you know, for us, we, we don't have altitude, we don't have heat, um, but what we do have is uh, a pretty rowdy, rowdy bunch of fans. So, you know, we're, we're really grateful for that. And we're happy we could bring a championship home for them. And, and there's a rumor going around that there's going to be a franchise in Toronto next year. How does that affect guys like you? We have the tugs, the, the strings, the, the heart strings, and the tug of the heart strings on maybe going back to a Canadian MLR franchise? Um, no, I. I Personally, I just think it's great. I think Canada really needs to get on board with the MLR. I think um, the impact that pro rugby had is as many flaws as there were. You can see the results of um, how well the U.S. team has done the last couple of years, uh, just providing that, that bottom base of the players uh, an opportunity to train day in, day out, and, and work on their rugby skills, rugby IQ. Um, so you can really see the bottom half of those that player pool raising up. And I think if, if Canada wants to... Uh, once to compete, we, we have to get on board with the MLR. And if, if that's Toronto, if that's Vancouver down the line, I think it's, uh, it's going to be awesome. Phil, what happened Saturday night? Well, I just shut it down pretty early. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I witnessed some of, the, some of it Saturday night, immediately after when you guys, both teams were together in that room in the Jenny Craig Pavilion for a rugby championship. Uh, that was where the party was. Uh, but, but, Phil, I, the players... Uh, acknowledged your work, your determination. I thought that was cool because your peers recognized everything that you did, and that was a, that was a good moment. No, and I really appreciate that. And um, you know, I, me and Shaloma battled against each other for so many years. Uh, it was just refreshing to play with them. And um, you know, like I said, without the leadership of those other guys, Shalom, Big William, Rasalika, um, Olaf Khalifi, uh, just to name a few, uh, I don't think it would have been possible. Just they really got behind the idea, and we, we all realized that. It, the situation we're in is, is the way it is, and uh, we just have to get on with it and um, you know move forward as a collective group. Would you want to wear both hats again next season? I don't think so. No, <laughs> uh, that, it, was, it was a challenge, and uh, you know I learned an awful lot, and I'm going to take those lessons forward. But um, for us to be successful, you know, next next year is a different story. You're going to have a real a real season of you know probably around 20 games if you make it to the final, uh, including preseason. So. Um, we're going to have to go a different direction, and we're in the middle of, of tracking down a couple of coaches right now and figuring out what, what's going to be the best fit for the Seattle Seawolves. He's available. Um, for me, I just, for me, I just <laughs> like to uh, I just like to mentor under somebody, learn learn a little bit more, and um, you know, I'm still enjoying my playing. I think I think Pete's doing a good job commentating right now. <laughs> wow, is that a, was that was that a, was that a subtle like, Canadian indictment of his coaching abilities? <laughs> It's okay, no, I, Phil. It's okay. Um, very, very uh, polite uh, way uh, of saying no thanks Phil's, to Phil me. is extremely polite. He's always done a great job with those of us involved in the broadcast and being available. And uh, um, I, the other thing I would you know, recognize, and I told Phil this on Saturday, is at the start of the season, I said, you know, what do you want to be? And he said, we want a strong set piece. 
and we want a strong defense and we want to have a strong collective. And I think that there's no more um, rewarding moment as a coach is when you get to the end of the season and you set meet the goals that you set out. And I think it says a huge amount for Phil and a huge amount for um, the players that he played with that they were able to live to the goals they set at the start. Yeah, yeah. that was great. Anyway, congratulations, Phil. And, and really, thank you for coming on. I, I know it was a big deal. You, you're traveling today. You, you know, get jump through hoops, and we really appreciate it, and we're, we're very happy. I'm happy I was wrong. <laughs> no, thanks, thanks for having me, and um, thanks for all the contributions throughout the season. I think you know, the MLR is here to stay, and um, you know, I just feel very fortunate to be a part of it year one, and I'm looking forward to year two and all the years to follow. Well, you got some more fans here. Pete, Martin, on behalf of Pete and Martin, I'm Matt McCarthy, and thanks to Mr. Phil Mack and Ryan Ginty. That's going to wrap up our Major League Rugby segment here at Fantasy Sports Network Studio 34 for Rugby Wrap-Up in New York City for now. Thanks for tuning in.